Well, welcome to everybody and welcome to this session. It's a great pleasure to be here at the ninth Global Safety Patients Conference. And what a day to be able to speaking to you on today, of course, being 17th of September, World Patient Safety Day. I, like many others, are wearing some orange today in commemoration of this. So my role today is to act as the chairman of this panel session and also to give you some views by way of introduction. Uh, I, as I say, am David Jeffries. I am the president at the present moment of the Regulatory Science Committee, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers based out of Geneva, although I'm actually speaking to you for where my day job is here in London. I'm delighted this afternoon that we have with us two colleagues. For in morning time in the US, we have Andrea Furia Helms from the Commissioner's Office, who is the Director of Patient Safety in the Food and Drug Administration in the US. And then from Amsterdam, we have Natalie Beer, who is in charge of patient safety and patient engagement for the European Medicines Agency. So the way we're going to run this today is to look at the theme of regulatory harmonization and how that is playing in to benefit patients in a variety of ways across the globe. So really focusing on how does regulatory harmonization improve access to safe medicines, to vaccines in particular at the present time as we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and also to health devices. So a challenging task, we'll try and do this for you. We're each gonna give about 10 minute presentations and then we'll have enough time for some questions which will come to us via the chat and the panel discussion. So very delighted you can all be with us. So if I could have the first slide here, my title slide. So as you see, the issue that I want to share with you is this one of regulatory harmonization and how this plays into the space. So if we look at harmonization, this is something which I think has been going on in the regulatory area for quite a long time. In fact, in November, we have the 30th anniversary of the establishment of ICH, the International Conference of Harmonization. And that body has played a remarkable amount in harmonizing initially the regulations between the US, Japan and Europe, but now on a truly yeah. global manner. And I think that's been very important because that disease really knows no boundaries. I think COVID-19 has shown that to us. So that's been a very important trend. And if we look at this slide here, we can see that one of the benefits of harmonization is the ability to have reliance. That is that agencies can work together and increasingly they can rely on each other. And if we look at the left hand side of this slide, we see perhaps the intersection here of three important themes for you in the patient safety area. That of convergence, of trust and capacity building. And I think we can see through the work of the World Health Organization, their programs and of ICH, the variety of guidelines, we are bringing together that key interface whereby we're strength building and then strengthening and maintaining trust between the regulators and then trust with wider society, particularly patients. At the same time, we're bringing through that process convergence. We have different legislations in different parts of the world, but the same overlying principles and more and more we're converging on the requirements. And what that all means is at the bottom of the circles, the third of them, that means that we can share expertise, we can share approaches, and we can share capacity. And if you think about it, there's never been a time more important for that than in the middle of the pandemic. So on the right hand side of the slide here, you can just see some global examples which are already up and running. The mutual recognition agreements for GMP inspections. It would make and does make no sense to fly inspectors around the world from different agencies to inspect the same facility. And therefore, again, over about 40 years, we've had a convention, the PICS convention, whereby we have common standards and we can share inspections. And that means we can use limited resources to much more effect to safeguard the world's safety, world population. We've seen some really great examples recently in Africa. I think about the Zazibona initiative, which is working to share 
assessments between agencies in that part of Africa, largely laid out of Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, but with Zambia and Namibia and other key players, a really important initiative. Again, if we look at Mexico and Saudi Arabia, we have the abridged verification moves. And we see some of that now operating also with the, the Gulf states, with the Gulf Consultative Council. And then in Singapore, we see a lot of work around the verification of post-approval changes. If I can move on to the next slide then. Let's give a moment for that slide to come up. If not, we'll move on and as that slide is appearing. No, can I have the next slide? So we'll pause here. We seem to have a. I think my screen is frozen as well as the uh, screen the other side. So great. So what we wanted to share with you here is some of the regulatory trends whereby patients are involved. But what are the gains for that? And I think I hardly need to tell you that by having patients involved in the process, it means that researchers gain much greater insight into what really matters for patients with their disease. We shouldn't be treating to guidelines set up by regulators. No, we should be trying to meet what are the aspirations of patients from a particular molecule. That's very important. I think increasingly we're seeing patients involved across all the life cycle of medicines. We're seeing them engaged in the very early stages of a molecule being selected for development asking the question, what do you want out of this molecule, out of this development? We're then seeing patients engaged in the design of trials, and we're seeing more patient involvement in the reporting of trials. And I think here, the various initiatives for lay patient summaries has been very important. And then of course, particularly today, we need to have patient involvement, both in reporting adverse events, adverse reactions, but also engaged in some of those design programs for registries, capturing the data and promoting patient safety and feedback. And again, that will be particularly important when we come to COVID-19 vaccines, just as it is for some of those new treatments. And I think we can already see with some of the virtual media patient platforms, how much data we've gained so rapidly, which helps us advance new treatments for COVID-19. That is established, it's up and running and it's delivering, which is really powerful. So finally, if I can have the next slide on here, just to look at some of the regulatory trends. And I think those are very clearly involving patients. We're involving at all these cycles here and particularly important around health literacy. The fact that we need to do better in how we communicate the effective and safe use of our medicines. In my own company, we're very much involved in the area of research in dementia and also in the area of research for the elderly. And I think what we've seen with the pandemic is how the area of the internet has actually opened up for the elderly. If there's been one very positive thing out of the recent pandemic is how people in their late 80s and in their 90s are actually finding Zoom. They're actually finding WhatsApp they're now getting engaged in a ways they never would have done before. And often it's their grandchildren or even their great grandchildren have actually had time and the imperative to teach them. And I've certainly seen in my clinical area, so many patients and so many people who are now benefiting from getting access to technology, which back in February and March was completely alien to them. They've been given or shared pieces of equipment and they're now using this. I see this with my own mother-in-law who had never picked up an iPad or an iPhone in her life until actually in her case, May. And since then has become quite an avid user. What a change, how can we use that to guide patient safety? So if we look to see here, I think we have a lot of great capacities here. Digital health opening up a lot of ranges, a lot of opportunities for us across the globe. COVID-19 really pushing us 
and we need to use a lot of those flexibilities or agilities for the future, hard bake them into our system. And then harmonization, really important, but we need the patient voice, patient advocacy to really drive that change and make sure that we are bringing benefit for all countries, particularly at this key moment. So thank you very much. That was by way of introduction. I'd now like to turn to our next panelist to give her presentation and then we'll move forward seamlessly. And perhaps I'd ask the panelists to further introduce themselves. So let's move forward to our next presenter, if we may. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea, you're on screen, thank you. Yep. <laughs> Hi, hello, this is Andrea Furia Helms over from the US and um, I am the director of the patient affairs staff in the office of the commissioner at the Food and Drug Administration. And I'm just going to wait for my slides to be uploaded. So um, you have uploaded this. can you see the slides? I do. I see the slides. Okay, thank you. So just tell me when to advance in that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So thank you for joining us today and thank you to the International Alliance for Patients Organizations for this opportunity to participate and allowing me to share with you how FDA involves and, and advocates and patients and their perspectives in our regulatory work. Next slide, please. Okay, next. It has, I'm sorry. Is it on the next slide? I haven't seen Yeah, it. yes, please, yes. Uh, it should be the, the overview. I see the title slide. I can title slide, thank you, Ranch. <laughs> How's that overview? One before that. Yes, is that it with the overview of patient engagement resources? There question. you go, yep. I see it. Thank you. So during this presentation, just whilst we're waiting, can I encourage everybody? If you have comments, sure. please put them in the chat. Show in the chat so we can use them for our panel discussion. Thank you. Absolutely. So during this presentation, I'll start with an overview, including why patient perspectives are valued in FDA's work. A tad bit of history, um, not enough to bore you but just to give you a little insights um, about our history in patient engagement and discuss ways FDA includes patient and advocate perspectives in our regulatory activities. I'll also share some resources that may be helpful to you. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. So I just wanna start with why we feel hearing from patients and caregivers is so important. Patients and caregivers, they provide really great insights um, about their needs and priorities that are important to them and, and their family members. They have a lot of diverse opinions and experiences and they shed light on things like risk tolerance and potential benefit. But of course, another thing they really share is the real world experiences in their real world settings. This is what reminds us of the human element and how these diseases and conditions impact patient and caregivers and their families every day. So ultimately, patients are at the heart of FDA's work and activities. Next slide, please. So I, I realize this is a very busy slide, um, but in a good way, I'm not gonna go through the whole slide. Um, it's really only to demonstrate that there's been ongoing patient en engagement activities at FDA, and they've been increasing over the last th 30 years. So when did patient engagement really start? That's a tough one to pinpoint, but there was an increase in engagement at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis in the late 1980s. But since that time, involving patient stakeholders in our work has been continuously increasing and evolving ever since. Next slide, please. So 
So I want to talk a little bit about um, patient affairs staff and who we are and what we do. But before I get to that, I want to get a little bit more into the history. As I mentioned, there was an increase in engagement at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis in the late 1980s. In response to this, an office was established to interact and build relationships with patients and advocates, specifically at that time with the HIV AIDS community. But that office eventually expanded to include oncology and then eventually all serious and life-threatening diseases and conditions. In more recent years, center-specific patient engagement offices and staffs have been established. As you can realize that each center has unique um, products that they regulate. So hearing more directly from patients regarding those particular products is very helpful. Patient Affairs was established in late 2017. We had a trans FDA study on patient engagement activities that really determined a need for a cross center effort at the commissioner level. And the focus of patient affairs is on cross cutting issues. And it's also to be the central entry point or we're like the front door, if you will, um, for patients who do not know where to begin in contacting the agency. So we work very closely with the medical product centers and that's including the drugs, biologics and device centers, as well as other offices in the office of the commissioner. And we collaborate with patient communities we're always looking to enhance patient engagement efforts, and ultimately, we're always looking for ways to include patient perspectives in FDA's work. Next slide, please. So these are just some of our programs and activities that I want to talk about today. The patient listening sessions, the EMA FDA patient engagement cluster, the patient engagement collaborative, and how we're enhancing communications. Next slide, please. And so I'll start with the um, patient listening sessions. Next, step, next slide, please. So patient listening sessions are one of the many ways FDA is expanding patient involvement. They really encourage communication between the patient community and FDA staff. Currently, we're focusing this, the listening sessions on rare diseases and, and are conducting in collaboration with our partner, the National Organizations for Rare Disorders, through a memorandum of understanding. And I also want to acknowledge um, another partner, the Reagan Udall Foundation for FDA. They've also been helping to support these important sessions. So patient listening sessions allow FDA staff to engage with and hear experiences directly from patients, caregivers, and advocates to really better inform medical product development and other regulatory issues. So, like for example, listening sessions can provide an understanding of disease and treatment burden, functionality and impact on daily activities, and what priorities we really should consider when developing medical products. So, and what they also do is they educate the review staff about rare diseases. Um, it also, just having patients and caregivers attend these sessions, it helps them understand FDA's work a little bit better and our mission. And it's, a, it's sort of a starting point to inform early stage research and development. Next slide, please. So there are two types of listening sessions. And um, they can be either requested by FDA or they can be requested by a patient organization. So when FDA requests them, and that's usually the review division that's requesting them, the staff has a specific set of questions to ask a particular patient subpopulation. When patient groups request a listening session, they just have this sense or need that they feel like they need to share their experiences and perspectives with FDA so that FDA understands really what's important to them. During these sessions, FDA staff will either ask questions or simply listen to better understand the patient perspective and as they live with this disease or condition every day. We've completed 12 sessions so far this year and we have about four more scheduled for the remaining of the year. But because of the high demand, and because we're such a small staff, <laughs> um, at this point, um, patient requested ones are being scheduled for 2021. 
The link at the bottom of the slide is where you can find more information about our listening sessions, how to request one, and the meeting summaries for those that, that have been conducted so far. Next slide, please. So something we always hear about, and I'm sure Natalie and others at EMA hear about is, um, why doesn't FDA and EMA collaborate more? Well, we actually do, and there's a lot of collaboration going on between the two agencies. And just for one example, um, the EMA and the FDA established a number of clusters over the years you know, and in various topic areas, such as pediatric, medicinal um, products, oncology, hematology products, pharmacovigilance, rare disease, blood products, and one of the more recent years, and, and the recent years that we've actually established is um, the patient engagement cluster. And that's because the two agencies really feel how important patient engagement is, is such a priority for both agencies. And we had a mutual fellowship, Natalie and I, <laughs> which we had some mutual learnings um, that really drove the establishment of this patient engagement cluster. So what we do in these, these clusters, we, we meet quarterly. We share our approaches for engaging and involving patient stakeholders. We talk about high profile topics of mutual interest, especially those with uh, potential high public interest. And we look at our priorities and goals and how we can continue to collaborate and learn from each other to enhance engagement efforts. Uh, I'm sharing a little reference at the bottom of the screen, and this is a, a published article that, um, that we, both of us have, and others involved, have published together, and it really shares about our mutual learnings and what we've implemented from them. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm locked up here. Sorry for the delay. Okay, now I wanna talk about the Patient Engagement Collaborative, or as we call it, PEC um, for short, because we love our acronyms. Um, the PEC is a collaboration between the FDA and the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, which is also known as CITI, and through our public-private partnership. This group is comprised of patient organizations, as well as individual representatives to explore topics about enhancing patient engagement in our medical product discussions and regulatory discussions at FDA. The first core hope that, that uh, launched in August of 2018 really wanted to focus on communications. So they've been helping us to improve our four patients webpage. That's the name of our, our patients page. Um, and now we are discussing a program to, um, to create for educating patient communities about FDA, what we do, what we don't do, and how they can really get involved. Um, next slide, please. So, one of the things that we also are working on is to enhance our communications. We always want to continually um, engage with our communities, patient communities, and we want them to be engaged with us. So we heard loud and clear from our patient stakeholders that one of the things was they were very confused about where to begin to find information. Um, so we've been working to enhance various means of communications. As I mentioned, we are working to, um, with the Patient Engagement Collaborative, and one of the things that we're working on is to improve our four patients webpage. Um, we are aiming to keep connected with the patient communities through our social media, such as Twitter. Uh, and we share important safety announcements and updates or um, if we're speaking at conferences such as this one. Um, we have educational web webinar series, I'm sorry, educational video series, and that's called the Patients Matter. And this is really to help patients and caregivers better understand FDA, our programs, and how, we can, how they can get involved. And we also maintain a database of patient advocacy organizations. So we send targeted emails um, to them and, and what things that might be relevant to their specific communities. Next slide, please. And so the following slides are just resources for you that might be helpful. Next slide, please. 
So this is another busy slide. It's, it's not meant to go through. It's just a resource of contacts and, and links and URLs um, if you're seeking to learn more about the patient engagement programs across the agency. As you can see, there's some from the Office of the Commissioner, and then there's specific um, engagement um, activities that occur within each of the medical product centers. Next slide, please. And because our patient stakeholder feedback was very um, indicative that um, it wasn't so easy to know where to begin to contact FDA, we worked closely with the medical product centers in creating this patient portal or web form um, so they can submit inquiries and request meetings. So it's called Patients Ask FDA, so they can easily find how to send their question in or request a meeting. Next slide, please. So I think we all know that patient communities, especially rare disease communities and families, have been profoundly impacted by COVID-19. So there were new questions and new situations arising from this pandemic. So we've been continuing to engage with communities to hear about these impacts. Um, so for example, FDA experts participated in webinars um, with organizations such as the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and of course the National Organization for Rare Disorders, to answer questions about how the agency is adjusting to these uncertain times and how we can better understand to meet patient needs as best as possible. And because there's a lot of new information constantly coming out of FDA about COVID-19, um, which is always available off of the FDA.gov website, um, which is at the top, but patients were having a hard time finding specific information for them because there's a lot of information for healthcare professionals, for industry on that page. So what Patient Affairs did is created a separate page um, that would take the relevant information off that main page and really create a, a resources for patients and caregivers specifically. And so that can be found off of our For Patients page. Next slide, please. And finally, this is the patient affairs team um, and feel free to contact us. We are happy to help anytime. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions you may have. Right, Joe, thank you very much indeed for that presentation. Uh, I think in view of time, we are running a bit short of time and we have one or two IT problems. Let's go directly to the next presentation. And Natalie, could I ask you to give your presentation and the view from the European Medicines Agency? Yes, certainly. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, likewise to Andrea, um, I'm going to be giving you an overview of how um, EMA engages with patients and uh, the journey, how we do it, and basically what we've learned along the way. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, is that fine? Can you all see, hopefully? There we are. So basically today um, we're pleased to be able to say that we do have patients involved in our everyday work. So it's an integrated part of the day-to-day -day business. Um, obviously this didn't happen overnight. Um, sorry, the slides are very... It, it would be what we would call a progressive journey. So it started back when we opened with some initial dialogue with patients. We then developed a working group with them. They became members of our committees. We had a framework of interaction. We developed our working party with patients and consumers, uh, a dedicated department, expanded further involving young people. And then um, today, not that we haven't stopped expanding and, and, and trying to improve, but we do have them systematically involved in um, all aspects of, of our work. And here this just demonstrates what we call the medicines regulatory life cycle. So you can see they're involved not only during the evaluation of those marketing authorization applications, but even before that in the pre-submission phase um, in different areas. And, and I'll talk about those in a bit more detail in a moment, but also the evaluation and then into the post authorization phase as well. So we carry on involving them in the, in the safety of the medicines once they are um, out there in the market. So as we've had our, our, our learning journey, um, what we've really tried to do is um, 
test out different methodologies, work together with the patient groups and see what works best in what areas. And I think it's increased not only in numbers, but also in the way that they were or they are involved. And um, I think it's important to understand that, you know, patients and carers and consumers can be involved with the regulatory aspects in, in very different ways. And I think it's important to understand as well, depending on what activity they might be involved in, then they would be representing their particular community or themselves in a, in a different way. So we have kind of three main areas and one would be representing their community. So the, the patient community, and this would be when they are members of our management board and our, and our committees. But then other times like on our working party or if we have consultations or workshops, then they would be coming uh, invited as, as their organization representatives. So they would be bringing the views of that particular um, patient uh, therapeutic area, for example. And then the other way is through individual experts. And that's when we really bring them into the individual medicines assessment, because we share everything with them, all of the confidential information, they then participate as individual experts. So they will be bringing obviously their own knowledge and experience of living with the condition or as a carer. Um, also having obviously discussed with other patients nowadays with social media, as we heard earlier, patients are a lot more in contact with each other. So even if we are only um, discussing with one or two patients, obviously those often those patients have um, been in contact with a lot more patients too. And then they can also share the views of the others as well. Each year we do an annual report to make sure that we're transparent and open in the way that we are engaging with the various stakeholders. So this is just a little bit more detail because people often say, okay, they're involved everywhere, but what does that actually mean in practice? How do they get involved? So I mentioned they're, they're, they're committee members. They are members as every other committee member. So they have a exact same voting um, rights. They join every single meeting. They receive every information the same. Of course, their role is slightly different than the scientific experts. For them, their role is to make sure that any aspects from a patient perspective that may have been not thought of are brought to the table for discussion. And also it's their role when we are really discussing something um, perhaps rather, rather um, delicate, maybe it's a, it's a borderline benefit risk evaluation, then they would look to bring in additional patients who have experience of the condition and also share their information with the committee because of course one member or two members cannot understand every condition that there is. There's also scientific advice procedure. So this is where the, the, the sponsors, companies come and ask EMA for advice on their development plan, often on the, the feasibility of the clinical trial design. And then again, um, we bring in patient representatives as well to give their views on those uh, uh, proposals. Often they give advice you know, to, to the group about um, proposed endpoints, what are the kind of things, their unmet needs, so what would they be looking for in a new treatment, what kind of uh, trial design would lend for adherence rather than dropouts, et cetera. So it is very useful information for the group to have. The next one is during the evaluation of medicine. So then the committees and usually the CHMP, which is our main evaluating committee, but also the, the, the PRAC, which is the pharmacovigilance committee, the safety committee, can convene what we call uh, expert group meetings. And it's really when they want to have specialists from across Europe in that particular area to get together and answer some predefined questions that they have on the um, data that they've received on this potential medicine. So uh, we will always, again, systematically invite at least two or three patient uh, representatives to join these small discussion meetings. And as I said, really get into the details of, of, of the different views and perspectives. Um, and it's very interesting for the, for the patients to hear from the healthcare professionals from here, from the regulators and vice versa. Stakeholder meetings as well. These are rather larger meetings and these are on often areas where we really need to get um, more people around the table. So again, we might have a, a safety issue. Um, one that comes to mind was methotrexate, and this is about, um, you know, just the safety. And here we want to have um, everyone, including the company there, patients, um, medication error specialists, hospital pharmacists, GPs, everyone around the table. So really we can work together and look at the way, best way to raise awareness of these safety issues and which are the ways that are best gonna reach out to the individual audiences. Public hearings is another one, um, which is also convened by the safety committee. And again, this is um, quite similar to the FDA ones, but where everybody can come and have a voice, which is then broadcast on a specific medicine that we're evaluating as well. I, I'll talk about them a bit later. 
and then we invite patients to all of our workshops and they get sent the public consultations for comment as well and finally they also review all of the documents that we prepare um, for the target for, for the patient audience so for example package leaflets safety communications risk minimization measures educational material etc really to make sure that it is um, written in an appropriate language um, for patients to understand this is the network um, I won't go into too much detail, I realise we're short for time, but without this network of patients, um, consumers and carers, really, we would never be able to fill all of these opportunities that we have for engagement. So um, we're very thankful to all of these. They're European organisations, they can register to be what we call an EMA eligible organisation. They need to meet certain criteria, you know, being non-for-profit, having patients um, at, the, at the core of their activities, etc. We also, um, from those eligible organizations, some then join our Patients and Consumers Working Party, which meets four times a year. And then individuals, because sometimes patients are not part of a patient organization and that shouldn't stop them being involved with us. So we also have a database where you can see here's the registration um, where individual patients can register with us. They can register to be involved in activities and tell us which ones they might like to be involved in but they can also just purely register to receive information from us in a specific area. So they can be up to date on the latest information on a particular uh, medicines on the disease area that they're interested in. And also the network goes broader and we collaborate obviously with the EU medicines agencies, but also as you heard from Andrea, also from the FDA, also with um, the other regulators as well. We often share, share practices. This is just some of the things that we've also learned along the way that really help engagement work well. You can't just involve patients in these rather technical meetings or discussions without giving them appropriate training and support. And people like to do that in different ways. So we have information sheets, videos, we provide them with one-to-one -one support before they come in, we give them a call, run through everything, and make sure they understand their role. And we also have web pages and we have an, an annual training day. Likewise, I think it's important to make sure we have different methodologies for engaging them because sometimes we want to do a written consultation so we can really target a larger group of patients. Other times we want to have that in-depth discussion so we'll bring a few patients in. Other times we might need something a bit more quantitative, maybe we'll do a patient preference study. So it's just about having the flexibility and then deciding on a case-by-case -case basis, what are the timelines, who are we trying to reach, what are the questions we have, let's look what's the best way to do this um, in this particular case. It's also important to monitor what we're doing, make sure that everybody is happy with the way things are working, is everybody walking away with something out of it. Um, so we need to measure the value and impact without um, kind of subjecting individuals to any particular scrutiny. So here's an example of a three-year survey we just finished in the scientific advice procedures that I mentioned earlier. And this is when we asked the regulators, the assessors, and also the patients, you know, how they contributed and whether or not they felt they were able to contribute. And then from the assessor side, you can see here the kind of aspects I mentioned earlier that the um, patients gave input, endpoints, population, quality of life, standard of care, et cetera, study feasibility. But I think more importantly, we asked the regulators what, you know, what were the patients contributing to the outcomes? And you can see here that actually almost a quarter of uh, all the patients involved, something they said or, or gave input resulted in a change or a modification to that final advice given to the companies. 53% um, also resulted in further discussion during the meeting. And we have to also take into account that almost 80% actually agreed generally with the development plan. So we're not always looking for a disagreement for that to be impactful. I think it's important to understand, okay, we, we agree with your proposal. It sounds feasible to us. And we also review the comments we get on those documents I'd mentioned. And more or less, it's about 50% of their comments lead to then a change in the final document. And I think it's really important to feed this back to those patients because of course, a lot of people are volunteers and it's important that they can understand that this does result in change or, or, or um, an impact in the outcomes um, for everyone. Obviously, we're, we're so focusing on safety of medicines today. So just very briefly, we're just talking about that last post-authorization phase. Um, Dave, you also mentioned earlier about direct reporting. And so obviously we try and encourage patients to report their um, 
side effects directly to their authority or to the company or to their healthcare professional. And of course, then at Europe, we have the UDRA Vigilance Database, which houses then all of those reports. We continually look for any signals of any um, safety issues, and then that triggers procedures which will happen. And those procedures happen then in our safety committee, the, the PRAC, and in that committee we have patients as members. They then can also convene the expert meetings we mentioned, so we then um, get their input directly from those affected. We sometimes do written consultations and surveys, the stakeholder meetings, public hearings again, which are convened by the PRAC, and then um, workshops and other. And here this was just to give you a, um, an overview of the last two hearings that we had, the public hearings. One was on Valparate, on how to minimize the risk of harm from those taking Valparate to the unborn babies. And the other one was on um, how to raise awareness of the uh, side effects of taking quinolone or fluoroquinolone antibiotics. And really the input we received from all of the stakeholders made a tangible difference to the outcomes. It really did lead to restrictions, restrictions in use of these medicines, very thorough educational materials designed, co-designed with the patients themselves, a communication campaign, and then what kind of research they felt we should do. So my last slide, I think, just as this is what we've learned along the way, <clears throat> and we're very, excuse me, happy to share that it, it's important to consider who you're engaging with, create that diverse group of stakeholders, have criteria to involve with them, test and implement various engagement methodologies, make sure you support them properly, be transparent as well on all the information and outcomes, monitor that it's going well and everyone's walking away with something, um, and make sure we engage along the whole life cycle from beginning to end and you know beyond. Um, looking ahead, of course, we need to make sure that we can now adapt. We've heard earlier about the new ways of data collection, new digital ways, so we need to make sure that we can adapt to receive those new kind of informations, the, the broader data collection as well, enrich the training and support perhaps with those new tools, um, encourage also sponsors and provide them with guidance, um, and of course more recently with COVID to make sure that we communicate well. We also have dedicated web pages and make sure also that we're ready to um, cope with the new demands that come up. Yeah. I think we've already mentioned this. Um, so my summary messages are that, you know, bringing those real life aspects into the scientific discussions increases transparency and understanding, and we all should play our role in making sure that it happens. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Natalie. Well, thank you, and, thank uh, you very David. much indeed. We've run out of time, unfortunately. I'm getting various messages on there. Can I thank Sorry. you very much, Natalie? Also, thank Andrea. I think we've got a whole series of really fantastic questions on the chat. I think what we, I'll ask the co-presenters, we'll try and respond to some of those on the chat function. I think questions have covered things such as tolerance for risk, how do you balance that? How can FDA involve more international collaboration? And I think also a key question which comes from several people is, how can best practice between these two major agencies be shared more widely for other parts of the world? So some great comments around there. Uh, let us try to reply to those online. We haven't time now for questions, yes. but thank you for all for engaging. Thanks. I might suggest these are some of the questions which we could frame for another session with IAPO yeah, uh, yeah, on a future occasion, but we need to stop there. So thank you very much I'll indeed. Thank uh, thank you very much. I think we'll we'll put those questions to you in writing and then ask uh, send them over to everybody else. And we need another session. I think uh, regulatory reliance is really important for us, and we would take this forward in a separate session. Um, there's a chance at the uh, Asia Pacific Patients Congress coming up soon, and we'll look at that. But uh, now I would like to thank everybody who's uh, joined us, the panelists, uh, FDA and EMA. Please thank your colleagues and your teams that prepared such nice. Uh, presentation as always. Sadly, it wasn't a face-to-face -face as we had last time in Miami, but uh, that's how things go. But you have been sterling, you really helped us through. And now I will ask uh, the audience to go into the auditorium and let's hear from the Ch Chief Medical Officer, um, Dr. Joanne uh, Walder Stryker, who comes from Johnson & Johnson's talk about how to fix small things and build them into big with patient safety. She's talking about the whole spectrum of things that we have discussed through these two days that uh, from a simple bandage right down to the last health device, all of them have to be safety. So safety is flowing through everything 
regulatory safety, everything. And it will be a great session. So I'll see you over on the other side. And thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.